number of people here. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to yet another Research Forum online seminar. Um, it's fantastic to welcome my colleague Mark Heron, who's acting head of the School of Conducting, rather important and um, it, school within the RNCM. He's taught there at, for 13 years, um, and also he's taught at the University of Manchester. He's been described as a leading conducting pedagogue with a, a very strong international reputation. And we can see this in his um, important work. For example, his many collaborations with composers, and notably the RNCM's Adam Gov in the recent uh, opera, The Path to Heaven, but many other collaborations beyond the RNCM with George Benjamin, uh, Magnus Lindbergh, James McMillan, um, Colin Matthews, Mark Anthony Turnage, and I could mention many more. He's 26 CD recordings of contemporary wind repertoire, and he made an important contribution to the last Reft impact case study on the wind ensemble. And these are with labels such as Shandos, Naxos, um, Philip, uh, Polyphonic, and many others. Um, a couple of years ago, he succeeded in getting uh, European funding for a major project, collaborative project called Conduct It. Um, and this has been, it's been a, allowed him to use his expertise as a conductor and pedagogue. And we're very lucky today that he's going to talk to us about this. There'll be plenty of opportunities for discussion at the end, as always. And I'd like to welcome everyone on, um, on um, um, YouTube as well, who's following us, as well as those of you on Zoom. Um, make sure that you keep your, your um, YouTube, your sound on silent when you're not asking a question and also be aware that you might not want your if you don't want your image to appear because you can see on on youtube those little images you might want to to um just put a black screen up there if you don't want to be seen but it is lovely to have all those faces in front of us please welcome mark heron Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much for uh, for joining me for this little uh, little presentation. Um, I suppose as a as a conductor, I, I spend most of my time trying to communicate in as few words as possible, and then I spend the rest of my time when I'm teaching conducting trying to to pass that strategy on to to my students. So so let's see how um, how this goes in a in a forum where presumably the use of quite a lot of words are, are expected. Um, just to, to add to the to slight feelings of bizarreness, I think this is the, the first day I've calculated, it's the first day since 16th of March that I, uh, I haven't been wearing shorts, um, but you'll be pleased to know that I did remember to put trousers on. So um, uh, I think you can only see my top half, but there shouldn't be any uh, major embarrassments. So a little bit of overview of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'll give a bit of, bit of context about teaching conducting and what that means and the particular challenges of that, um, which will lead into sort of why we, I felt the need that we should do this project, um, how the project came about and, and what it involves, and then uh, we'll end up with a bit of audience participation. So I'm very much hoping that you will all uh, join me in participating in an online conducting lesson. Uh, no, no previous experiences uh, is necessary. Uh, we're going from from the ground up, from conducting 101. Um, if you if you have a bat on, then then that's that's great. Uh, if not, uh, a, a pencil will will suffice. Um, absolutely fine. Uh, we'll, we'll get there in about 20 25 minutes, I guess. So maybe you just think about your the space you're in. So if you can if you can get yourself to a place where it's possible to stand up and stretch your arms out without knocking over any. Uh, laptop stands or small children or, or anything like that that would be that would be great so uh, without further ado let me just share my PowerPoint thing so we'll start with a start with a fairly big question um, can you can you teach conducting um, quote uh, once I get my window active there we are from Leopold Stokowski conductors are born not made um, he, he said that in 1943 and uh, sort of contrary opinion to that from Harold Faberman American conducting teacher uh, talking about how just at the time that conservatories were starting to teach conducting a new impediment to the training of conductor formed 
and basically blaming the media and the record companies for turning all these conductors into supermen. Uh, and of course, they were all men um, in, in those days. Um, and that this sort of mindset was very, very damaging to the training of conductors. I suppose he would say that, seeing as he's, he was writing that in the, the introduction to his textbook on conducting. But it's maybe interesting just to, to remind ourselves that conducting is a fairly young art form in, in terms of the musical world. Of, of course, there have been singers and, and instrumentalists for a lot longer than there have been conductors. Um, when, the, when the need for somebody to kind of pull together and direct a performance first came about, that was of course done by the composer. So the, the role of the conductor and composer was completely um, indivisible. It wasn't really until the early 19th century that we started to to go back and perform music by dead composers. Uh, Mendelssohn was one of the, the first people to do that, of course. Um, and it was in 1829 that he gave a, a performance of the Bach, Matthew Passion. So it was really from then on that we started to have this idea that, that one individual could take the responsibility for the direction of a performance of a piece of music that they hadn't, hadn't written themselves. So 1829, um, that's only, you know, of course, two years after Beethoven had died. So in, in the grand scheme of things, fairly, fairly recent. Um, and then something new begins. And then the, the pedagogy, of course, takes a, takes a while to, to catch up. Uh, there were the first conducting courses that uh, were, were started were in Paris, Vienna and London between 1905 and 1915. So um, most other places followed on from that. Here in Manchester at the RNCM, we started our junior fellowship in conducting in the late 1970s. We didn't start a master's degree until 2006. So the, the idea of conducting pedagogy is, is, is fairly young and, and in some ways slightly underdeveloped. Um, which of those do I believe? Are conductors born and not made or, or can you just teach it? I think the truth probably lies somewhere in the, in the middle. Uh, I quite like a, a quote from Claudio Bardo speaking 10 years ago or so. Uh, he was being interviewed about Gustavo Dudamel, uh, who was a the sort of young kid on the block at the time and Abado had been in, involved in, in mentoring him quite a lot. Um, and, and Claudio was asked what it was that made Dudamel special. And his answer, I think is quite good. He, he said that, uh, that Gustavo has all of the things that you can't teach. So therefore implying that perhaps there are some things that you, you're either born with or, or you aren't, um, but also there are some things that you can learn and, and be trained and, uh, and taught. The sort of things that maybe you're, you're born with, um, I suppose I'm thinking of, of uh, one of Sir Thomas Beecham's famous quotes when he said that some conductors have charisma and others have charisma. Um, there, are, there are some things that uh, as human beings we, we, we kind of have um, and, and maybe not. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, a little video. So here's, here's just a, a very, very short clip of five conductors starting off quite a, a well-known piece. So uh, there, there was no zoom lag there in that last one. That was uh, that was actually actually what he did. Um, so what do we what what do we have there? And, and I'm going to talk a little bit here about about the the what Faberman described as the impediments to the training of, of conductors. Um, we have five conductors conducting the same piece, 
beginning of the same piece. Uh, there's there's kind of a way to conduct the beginning of Beethoven five. So there's there's a there's a, a technique to do it. Um, certainly the first four of them pretty much did that. Num number five was was something else um, entirely. Um, and they were all conducting essentially a professional orchestra. So even with all those commonalities, if you like, those 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 common factors between their approach. Um, we see, of course, that there's a huge difference in, in all those in all those conductors, uh, different gender, different age, different height, different width, different physicality, different lengths of arms. Um, we're all we're all completely different. And as I look at uh, all all of you wonderful human specimens in front of me, um, if I if I was to to ask you to to simulate exactly my way of conducting um if if barbara or michelle or maria or daniel or anybody was to just copy me exactly it would be unnatural it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't work so that's a, a particular challenge in how we teach conducting because there's there's no instrument you know if you put a put a violin under somebody's chin or a cello between their legs or a trumpet on their face there's there's something uniform something around which you can build a technique and approach and a, and a school of playing um, in, in conducting, we don't have that. We can also consider the incredible variety of, of what we might conduct. So that can be in terms of genre. We could be talking about orchestras, choirs, brass bands, wind bands, jazz groups, contemporary ensembles, um, opera productions, all, all kinds of things, a huge, huge variety. Maybe a bit more interesting though is to, is to think about the different experience and ability levels of what we might conduct yeah so if you're standing in front of the berlin philharmonic or the london symphony orchestra they in many ways don't really need you if you're doing standard repertoire with with, with those ladies and gentlemen they can play the piece without you so there's no there's no technical requirement in in terms of them starting and stopping and playing the right notes in the right place um your role there is one of a of artistic leadership um, to, to give a vision to, to decide how all those opinionated and disparate individuals are going to play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony that particular week. On the other end of the spectrum, if you go down to um, to working in education, to working music education, perhaps with, with young musicians who maybe only know five or six notes each, uh, your role is, is extremely different. There's not much space for artistic vision um, in, in that world. Uh, your your job is, is to help them start and stop together, to train them to do that. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of pedagogy uh, involved there. You know, what is the fingering for a G sharp or, or how does that rhythm actually go? And then of course you have that vast um, continuum in, in, in between of all, all of that. Um, and even, even if you're talking about, you know, like an RNCM orchestra, for example, you know, a, a first or second year orchestra of undergraduate music students, you know, they'll, they'll all be, uh, they'll all be playing most of the pieces they're playing for the first time. So there's a certain degree of, of pedagogy in there, um, even though there might be some artistic leadership as well. So another, another challenge in how we teach people to, to deal with those very different, uh, different situations. Another thing to think about is that most people who conduct are not full-time conductors. Yeah? Many, many people will have conducting as part of a wider portfolio activity, uh, but a relatively small percentage will, will be doing it on a full-time basis. So by that, I guess we could meet a, a music teacher for whom perhaps maybe something like 10% of their job is conducting ensembles, choirs, bands, etc. Um, we could be talking about professional orchestral players. Um, they might be invited to come and take a, a sectional rehearsal with a, a youth orchestra. Um, they might go and work with an amateur orchestra because of their ability to make the string players sound better. Um, we can also be talking about people with, with proper jobs um, who maybe conduct in the amateur world, who conduct choirs or, or bands or orchestras once, once or twice a week. So the vast majority of people who actually conduct uh, for them, uh, a full-time course of study is, is neither, in a way, neither necessary nor, nor appropriate. Um, there are lots of conducting textbooks. Most of them are utterly terrible. Um, there's something fundamentally disconnect about such a visual thing as conducting and then an attempt to try and write it down. So there are quite a lot of them. I don't recommend any of them particularly. Um, if you suffer from insomnia, let me know and I'll send you a list. It'll, it'll send you off to sleep. Uh, in, in no time at all, but I think it's, it's incredibly, I find it incredibly difficult to read dense paragraphs of text and then see all these kind of diagrams that they do and, and, to, and to turn that into, into an imagination of how that would be, would be physically. It's also quite resource intensive. Um, 
if you want to get better at playing the clarinet, you can have a lesson and then go away and practice for eight hours a day by yourself. Um, that doesn't really work with conducting, no matter how many times you might wave your arms along to the, the end of Mahler 2 on your favourite YouTube recording. That's not really going to, uh, to, to teach you or make you effective as a conductor. We, we, need, we need people to, to respond to as people to conduct. So uh, the resources involved in it are quite, quite tricky. Um, I think it's also worth saying that it's it's possible to be a, a, a pretty decent conductor without training. Um, as as instrumentalists, as players and singers, we we spend a lot of time, if you like, consuming conducting. Um, we 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 see it, we see it good, we see it bad, we see it somewhere in between. Hello, I can't hear Mark. Can can anybody else? Can you hear me? You can hear Mark. So we need to send him a message to ah, ask him. Right. Ah, he's back. back. Fantastic. Over ah. back over to Mark. So where did we where did we get to? Did did you see any of that video? No. No. Okay. Well, let's let's try try that again and see if it uh, survives the screen share this time. of that on YouTube if you want to go want to go finding it um, of course it's funny it's, it's entertaining um, but the, the the serious point um, is that of course if you're talking about professional context players can ignore that kind of conducting they, they, they just switch on to autopilot uh, put their head down look at the concert master and and do their thing and everything is fine but if you if you transport that into uh, the world of music education or community music making then it's a whole a whole other different thing, um, and I've seen of of course I've seen this so many so many times uh, where you get music teachers who, in almost all respects, they're absolutely fantastic. They're they're really good musicians. They're great at teaching their instrument. Their pedagogy is fantastic. They're inspirational. They're really committed. They're loved by the students. Everything is fantastic uh, until the point at which they start waving their arms around, and then it can, sometimes can be quite can be quite catastrophic. And that's not that's not to be critical of them at all, but rather just to mention the fact that in in many many countries of the world, and the UK is one of those, we don't actually train music teachers how to direct ensembles. So they kind of just have to work out how to do it as they as they go along. Um, so big problem there, I think, and and, and something that the the world of conducting pedagogy hasn't yet uh, entirely caught up with. So what, what, what do we need? What, what am I suggesting? What am I, what am I talking about here? I guess I'm saying that 
for those relatively small percentage of people that want to have a full-time career as a conductor, that's all fine. Um, there are plenty of master's degree courses. Um, ours is great. There are plenty of others that are that are that are really really well done. Um, essentially, those people are pretty much looked after now, um, and there's not so many problems. Um, what we what we really need to work at and develop are new ways to train conductors, which is appropriate to the situation they're in, um, and principally the overwhelming majority of people for whom it's a it's a it's a part of a, a job. Um, and as I said, they're not going to go off and. Uh, do a full-time two-year master's degree and um, and frankly nor nor should they. We have been addressing that for a while at the RNCM. We have a, many of you will know we have a series of external master classes and short courses. Those have developed over the last 10 years or so. Um, they're very specific. We have courses for wind and brass conductors, for choral conductors, for orchestral conductors, for people who are um, in the amateur world, for people who are music educators, for people who are aspiring to be professional. Um, that's all great, um, but realistically, we can only really um, accommodate 50 or 60 people um, across a year of, of, those, of those courses. Um, given that we get around 500 or so applications for those, um, there's clearly a, a demand and a need um, for, for, for something else. And I guess that's where this, this project the, the, the ideas behind this project um, started to started to, to appear. So as Barbara said, it's a it's a, a European project. It's a, an Erasmus Plus strategic partnership. Maybe worth just just briefly touching on on what those are. Um, we all, we all know about Erasmus in terms of students doing exchanges, going off to uh, spend a term or a year in a different in a different country. Um, probably you're also aware of staff mobility. So I might go to Weimar for a week to teach the conducting students there, and the professor there would uh, come come to Manchester at a different time, and Erasmus pays for the travel and accommodation costs of that, which is great. Um, all of those kind of things are Erasmus key action one. Um, key action two of Erasmus, which I certainly didn't know anything about until I started looking into this, are strategic partnerships. The idea of those are that you build on existing relationships through exchanges and you uh, formulate the idea for projects which you can do collaboratively with several institutions, but um, you wouldn't be able to do on your own within your own institution. Um, of course, we're all very concerned about what's going to happen to Erasmus. Um, who knows where we're, where we're going to be in a year's time. But all projects that are going, fortunately for me, um, are committed to be funded. And actually, it was still possible to, to apply for an Erasmus strategic partnership. Um, even only six weeks ago, the, the 2020 deadline uh, was the end of March and it was extended until the, the end of April because of the, the lockdown. Um, so. It's maybe be a brave man to say that in a year's time you could apply for one of these uh, in the UK, but it's interesting to, to, to understand that the, the way the funding works is you have to have three minimum of three partners from three different countries um, and the funding is devolved to national agencies. So one of the institutions in your project is a host um, and you apply in that country. So I'm not sure it was going to be possible to apply in the UK in 2021, but it may well be possible for British institutions to be part of consortiums in other other European countries. So when you're when you're looking for your your next funding application, um, don't don't rule it out. It might it might continue for a, a little while yet. So how did it come about? Well, I suppose the first genesis of it was I think five or six years ago. The RNCM did a little collaboration with the Open University. Um, and they were doing a, a MOOC on uh, understanding a musical score. It was one of their introductory pre-degree courses, uh, looking at a, a piano score, a string quartet score, an orchestral score, um, and giving a guide as to what that notation meant. Um, so I was asked to be a part of that, and after I'd hurriedly gone off and Googled what a MOOC was, um, I signed, signed up and came back and, and, and joined in. Um, and my part in it was a series of, of small interviews, short interviews, um, about the role of a conductor and what a conductor actually does. Um, the course was fantastically successful. Uh, it, it still runs now. Um, uh, tens and tens of thousands of people have done it. Uh, and the feedback, a lot of the feedback that came from the participants was two, two things. One, um, well, that's really interesting for sort of general music lovers because uh, we never, we don't understand what conductors do. So it's really interesting to hear that talked about. Um, and the second thing was 
from people who maybe were involved a little bit in music and teaching who said, why are there no online resources for learning how to teach conducting? So I, I kind of sort of stored that away um, a little bit. And then a year or so after that, after that, I started going to um, Stavanger in Norway fairly regularly. Um, first as an Erasmus exchange, um, then going as a, as a guest teacher, um, and then teaching on their, their summer school programme. Um, interesting story for them is that they are also relatively young in the business of teaching conducting. They, they formed their course um, about 10 years ago in 2010. Up until that point, the only place you could study conducting full-time was in Oslo. Uh, Norway being a, a generously state-funded education system also means that they're, they're generously controlled by the, by the government education department. So if you want to start a new program or course in Norway, you have to apply for permission and go through all sorts of committees. So they did that uh, and they were told that yes, they could start a conducting program, um, fine to start a, a, a degree course, but also it was on the condition that they took responsibility for the training of uh, non-professional conductors for all the amateur conductors in Norway. Um, there's a huge culture in Norway of, of wind bands and brass bands, um, something like 5,000 wind bands in a country of um, 5,000 people, uh, 5 million people, um, and hugely, hugely well resourced and, and supported. Uh, so they, they were given the task of um, working out how to, how to help professional development for all these school band conductors and amateur conductors. And they did that uh, in kind of two ways. They started a summer school, which is called Dirigen Tuka, means Conductor's Week. That takes place in, in August. It's grown into, uh, I think last year there was about 120 conductors and there was about 10 or 11 of us teaching. Um, and they have all sorts of courses from advanced level to beginners, um, amateurs, schools, beginner bands, orchestral, brass band, wind band, all, all kinds of things. It's a, it's a fantastic week. But that also forms the first part of their digital conducting studio um, course, which is a, it's not a full-time course, it's a distance learning part-time thing. I think they have 16 people doing it over the year. Um, and the way it works is that week is the first part of it. Then they have a weekend in January where they go to Stavanger for some more teaching. And then they have a kind of assessment session in, in May. In between that, it's all online. So they have some pre-recorded lectures, um, various tasks to complete, uh, but they also have one-to-one -one video conferencing lessons um, on, a, on a regular basis. Uh, they, they invested quite a lot of money actually in a very posh um, high-end corporate video conferencing system about seven or eight years ago, and, and that's now essentially what Zoom is. So they could have saved themselves quite a, quite a lot of money, but uh, there we go. So essentially the the one-to-one -one online lesson where you can see each other, you can share screens, you can notate scores, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that, that I, I found that fantastic. I thought it was a great, a great way of doing it. I nicked most of those ideas and applied it to our conducting course for music educators with the, the sort of three visits and then in between the, the online element. Um, and that's, that's, that, that, works, that works really well. Um, but I think we, we, all, we all felt that there was room to do more and, and try, to, try to do something that was really gonna reach um, a lot more people. So what happened next was uh, my friend and colleague there, Morten Fensberg, who was the head of conducting, he's now the, the dean of the school there. He was at a, an e-learning conference and he met Naomi Barker from the Open University, who was the person um, I'd worked with on that MOOC. And we all worked out that we knew each other and started to talk about this and, uh, and put together the, the idea for this, for this project. So we got together with the University of Aveiro in Portugal. So those are the three countries, Norway, Portugal, UK, um, and four institutions. So Stavanger, Aveiro, RNCM and Open University. And we were awarded in September 2018, 400 and 436,823 euros was the, the funding for a, a, a three year project. So we're just um, just beyond halfway, halfway through that. If we if we started it all a year early, we might have had something to launch just as the as the lockdown started. Uh, but there you are. You can't have kind of everything. So here we go for screen again. So the project requires you to have intellectual outputs. We, we have two. Number one is, or we said in the application that it was going to be a MOOC. Um, it's a, a MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course, just in case anybody um, hasn't heard that. Um, 
kind of idea of what a MOOC is is kind of kind of slightly gone out of fashion, I suppose. I think that that market is maturing. Um, there are issues with retention of students through MOOCs if, if it's too structured, not everybody completes it and so on. So we probably decided to go something a little bit more flexible than that, but essentially uh, an online resource which will be aimed at conductors of all experience levels, um, certainly beginners, those with very, very little experience, but also be something that will be of interest to more advanced conductors, including people studying um, at master's degree level. Um, I think this is quite crucial that we're also trying to help conducting teachers. Um, as I said earlier, the, the pedagogy of conducting is, is relatively young. Development of people to give that pedagogy is, is also not yet particularly advanced. So a lot of people, if you're talking about the context of um, teacher training or um, undergraduate courses in universities, you know, a lot of people who are teaching conducting in those contexts maybe themselves haven't studied conducting. So, so what we're aiming for here is something that will be a resource for people who teach conducting. Um, it's all free, it's a condition of the funding that it's online, open access, nobody's allowed to make any money out of that. So it's kind of a charitable thing in, in, in some sense as well. But also just um, general music lovers, people, people um, as, as with the feedback for that first Open University MOOC, people with an interest in what conducting is um, and, uh, and what it's involved. Second intellectual output is blended learning courses. I'm sure we all know a lot more about blended learning now than we did three months ago, um, but essentially combining traditional forms of learning with, with new technology. So an example of that would be if you're running, as, as we do in the RCM, uh, if you're running a course for undergraduates uh, who are instrumentalists, an elective course in, in conducting, um, maybe maybe your course is something like eight two hour, two hour seminars spread across a term. Um, by utilizing this resource that we'll create, you can enhance that um, by giving more material and more structure. At the same time, you can maybe cut that down from eight courses to, to from eight seminars to six. Um, so saving on, on time, but enhancing the, the resource. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we've, we're committed to using that ourselves. We, we kind of already are in a sense within the partner institutions. Um, we'll, we'll also we'll publish guidance for other people to do that. So if you want to run a, an undergrad module, then you do this, this, this and this. Uh, if you want to run a, a day CPD training for music teachers, do this, this and this sort of thing. So a bit of, a bit of guidance as to how to, how to use the, the resource. So we sat down and decided what it was we needed to teach. Um, a colleague and friend, Mark Wigglesworth, um, English conductor, who's been doing a few sessions actually with our master students over the last couple of months. He brought out a very entertaining book uh, last year. It's called The Silent Musician. It's not a textbook, so therefore it's, it's not too dull. Um, worth, worth a read if you have, a, have an interest. And when he was writing that book, as he was going around uh, the world conducting the various orchestras that he did, he did a bit of a survey amongst orchestral players and said, well, you know what, what would you describe uh, are the necessary skill set for a, for a conductor? Um, so he collated all those responses and came up with a nice, concise description of what it was that a conductor needs to be able to do. I won't read this out. I'll let you just read it in your own time. So fairly, um, fairly daunting list of, uh, of skill set there. Just the uh, most important thing is don't tap the don't tap your baton on the stand. Uh, that's the, uh, the the best one. So structure of our, our resource that we're fairly far on with actually. We're we're kind of on schedule. Um, I think we all thought we might have tons of time uh, in the last three months to do it, but um, like most of you, I'm sure you've ended up being much busier than you expected to be, but we are making progress. Uh, I'm learning a lot about video editing, that's for sure. So uh, this is what it looks like. Um, the, the main course will have those three parts, practice room, careers, office, rehearsal studio, which I'll talk about in a second. We will have a, a, a MOOC, a mini MOOC, we're calling it at the moment. That will be a kind of entry level, um, very much beginners uh, course 
which will be on one of the main e-learning platforms, Coursera or FutureLearn or, or, or something like that, uh, sort of as a, as a hook to draw people into the, into the main course. Um, the library area maybe will be the place where general music lovers go just to sort of start digging into, into uh, the various material and see, see what they find. So the first of those main strands, the practice room, two parts to this. First side is, is the sort of practical conducting stuff, technique and, and rehearsal. Um, I think it's important that developing rehearsal skills starts right from the beginning. So we're going technique one, rehearsal one, technique two, rehearsal two, etc. Um, technique one, which we'll, we'll come to a little bit later on, um, starts really from the very beginning. You know, how you stand, whether you use a baton or not, how you, how you give an upbeat, what the patterns of two, three and four are, very, very basic stuff. By the time you get through to the end of rehearsal th of technique three, then you're, you're into um, mixed meter Stravinsky and uh, transitions in Verdi overtures and that sort of stuff. So covering really the full, the full range, of, range of thing. A little bit of the academic side, we're not absolutely not setting out to teach music theory, um, but there will be a little bit of stuff about score study, analysis from the point of view of, of, of studying a score, uh, and some, some background information about different kinds of orchestras, ensembles, choirs, bands, um, etc. and so forth. Um, what is the material going to be? It's, it'll be a mixture, it's a website, it'll be a mixture of text and images, but really quite a lot of, quite a lot of video, and that's, that's I think where we we make the leap away from the fact that textbooks are basically quite use, useless to something that, um, that can be really quite, quite useful. Um, one of the two great conducting pedagogues of the 20th century is the Finnish teacher Jorma Panula. Um, he is the guy who taught all the, the Finnish conductors who have fantastic careers, Sepeka Salonen, Osmo Bansko, Sakurai Oromo, Saraste, all, the, all, these, all these people. Um, and Jorma's great innovation was the use of video in teaching conducting. Um, he realised quite early on that this was an extremely useful thing in a, in a thing where as conductors we don't make any sound, or at least we probably shouldn't, um, everything. Therefore it's very difficult for us to get feedback on what it is that we're actually doing and how effective that is. Um, so Jorma brought in this idea right from the beginning of when it was possible to have um, portable video cameras and VHS video cassettes and so on. Uh, back in the 80s, he was using uh, video technology quite extensively and that's something we've really uh, taken on board. Careers Office, the second area there, is probably kind of aimed more at the, the slightly more advanced conductors, so people who are maybe already studying conducting or considering that as a, as a career. And this is a whole area that nobody really ever talks about. Um, there are no books about this for conductors, um, even in, in master's degree courses. You know, it's something that we focus on quite a lot at the RNCM, but I think we're, we're pretty unusual in that. Um, the, whole, the whole other side of what we do as conductors, leadership skills, of course, are incredibly important. Um, where you might go to study conducting, you know, the, the, the approaches to studying conducting are uh, very, very different in different parts of the world. Uh, in Germany, um, the pedagogy of conducting grew up around preparing people for a career in the Opera House, because that's where most of the jobs are. Um, in North America, the pedagogy grew up around uh, preparing people for academic positions, because that's where, where most of the jobs were. So lots of different decisions to be made in that respect. Programming, uh, all the, the kind of business stuff, you know, the first question on every young master's conducting student's lips is, how do I get an agent? Um, do you have to win a competition? What master classes can you go to? That, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of interviews in there. We've done a lot of interviews with managers of orchestras, with agents, um, the early career section at the bottom there. I've done a, a series of interviews with some of our more notable graduates over the past 10 years. So people like Duncan Ward, Jamie Phillips, Alpes Chauhan, Chloe Van Sotostede, people like that, who are you know, now standing in front of world-class orchestras with them talking about their journey because everybody's journey is, is completely different. There's no, there's no one set way to do it. It's, it's kind of not really the case that you leave college, do an audition and that's you sorted. Uh, there's much more freelance aspect to it than that. So that's a very, a very kind of important part of it and something that's not really been done. The rehearsal studio is a series of case studies. So what these are is a series of kind of roughly 30 minute documentaries about the process of rehearsing a piece in each of those different genres. I think we started out with five, but we're now at, we're now at seven. Um, so we have a cl classical orchestra piece, which will be, I think it's the first movement of Haydn's Drumroll Symphony, 
Symphony Orchestra piece is something that we're doing. Uh, we're meant to be doing it at the end of November. Let's see whether whether that happens or not. Uh, the brass band is Foden's brass band, can, can, uh, preparing for a contest, etc., etc., etc. Contemporary Music One is a, a project I did with our new ensemble back in January, I think, of this year, uh, with Errol and Wallen. Uh, and the crossover uh, project was something we did with the jazz pianist Gwilym Simcock back in November. So that was a collaboration between him and a few of his jazz mates together with a, a chamber orchestra, uh, which was a side-by-side -side project of RNCM students and BBC Phil players. So just to give you a flavour of that, it's just a couple of, couple of minutes of this video. As I say, it's about half an hour in the end, but I've just snipped it down to a couple of minutes to give you a, a sense of um, how that will work. Much more on than you think, yeah? So like even, for example, strings, when you have this da-da-da, yada, it shouldn't be da 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 da, -da it should be really quiet on. Da-da-da, yada-da, and even yours, but it's all about the inflection. And you can see accents that maybe don't need to be so heavy, or staccatos that hardly need to be played at all, and, and some notes that are, and you need to find your way into the, the nuances and inflections of that language. Because yes, it's the same notes, and it's the same notation, that's all we have, but we need to make it sound like Gwilym's music and not like uh, Gwilym's music with a very, very strong Brahmsian accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how much do you kind of work together at the rehearsal or, uh, or indeed beforehand as well when you're preparing this music? I think in a way, I mean, so, as with so many things in music, individual relationships are absolutely crucial. <laughs> now, industrial. This, um, originally this was a piano concerto that Gwilym wrote seven, eight years ago probably, um, that had three movements. And this is a movement that still is the same as it was originally. And what he's done is change the first two movements completely and replace them with one longer, more elaborate movement in five. Your ability to count in five will improve greatly over the next, over the next 48 hours, <laughs> for sure. It's really complicated. About there. So, one, two, two, two. And that just prepares you not to be early in that next bar. So here we are, just after the first rehearsal. Um, nobody got hurt. Nobody got hurt. <laughs> nobody <laughs> threw anything. No bloodshed. Nobody stormed out and said, I can't possibly work with these people. So that's progress. I have things in that movement, but not much. Yeah, the ending is the me. That's wonderful. Should we just play from the double F? Or do you want to go earlier? Double left? Double left is fine. So just, I'm, I'm simply listening to Martin in that 9 8 bar. Yeah. I mean, I, I just watch him because I can. So, fairly unusual to, to have something as structured as that where we have cover all those different genres and you're actually able to see the process right from the very beginning, warts and all, um, going through. Um, most professional orchestras are very good about allowing uh, young conductors into watch the rehearsals, but they tend not to put the first rehearsal on TV. Um, so something something useful useful there. Uh, that's not the absolute final edit yet. So if, if you noticed a little typo there, um, don't worry, we, we are aware of that and we will fix it. Um, the technique aspect of things. So this is something that I'm kind of working on quite 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 closely, um, along with Alex Webb, who you saw interviewing the questions there, also on this on this call. Um, this is this this is a scan of a page from the 
kind of material that was used uh, by Clark Rondell, my colleague, uh, when he was an undergraduate student, which is really a long time ago, at Northwestern University in Chicago in the early 1980s. So that was material that he was his teacher uh, used with him. Uh, he brought it to Manchester in 1984. Um, I remember then uh, learning from it uh, under Clark's direction when I was an undergraduate in the early 90s. Uh, and then I started to use it myself about 10 years after that. Um, and I've been, over the last 10 or 12 years, I've been kind of evolving and expanding it um, and typesetting it. Um, it starts off as just, I think it's about a dozen little exercises. Um, we're now at the point where we have, I think, something like 47 different um, extracts uh, which are designed to teach um, a, a different area of, of conducting this. This is number two of, of the workbook. It's very, very much the early stages. It now looks like that middle image rather than the, the one on the left. Very nicely typeset, very, very posh looking. Um, and this material will all be available on the website, accompanied by videos demonstrating how to conduct this. And you'll be able to view this online um, and also download the material. So there'll be scores, piano reductions, and transposed parts in every imaginable transposition. Um, so the idea being that you can use this wherever you are with whoever, whoever you want. Uh, if you happen to have a group of, a, I don't know, a, a violin, an alto saxophone, a euphonium and a bass guitar, you can, you can use all this material uh, and, and use it to, to practice um, and, and develop. So that's quite a, an interesting aspect of it. So I promised you a conducting lesson. So this is it. So uh, so if you could all um, if you all just stand up and stretch out a little bit, be nice nice for you all to to, to join in. Uh, be good for your good for your body and, and well being, and uh, make you feel nice and, and relaxed before the end of the day. So we start with posture. Um, very important that we have good posture. Firstly, from the point of view of giving authority. Um, if we're kind of leaning over and bending down, that reduces our uh, our authority. But there's also a big a big thing about health and well-being, preventing tension and pain in your back and neck. I've had conversations with um, four or five conductors, I think. Some of them really quite famous um, during the lockdown, um, saying things like, "Well, you know, one silver lining of not having any work for three months is that I'm actually giving my body a chance to recover." Um, it's not uncommon for conductors to take six months off to uh, have a back operation or spend half their fees on uh, physiotherapy. So getting that right from the beginning is, uh, is really useful. So we stand up straight, really up straight, head and shoulders back. Think of your head being on, on top of your spine, not in front of your body. Feet should be slightly apart, not too far, but maybe, maybe kind of underneath your shoulders. Weight balance nice and equally in terms of front, back, left and right. So you don't want to be kind of on your tiptoes doing a ski jump thing. You don't want to be lying back too much and we don't want to be rocking from side to side. So nice, nice and nice and even. A few little exercises to, uh, to um, get you warmed up before we go. Three little quick routines. So here, uh, here comes Melvin, one of, our, one of our conducting students, also on the, on the call here. So the first one, little video, video clip, we all just do, do this <coughs> along with Melvin. So we're gonna swing our shoulders around. So that's it, nice and nice and relaxed. Just keep that going. Very nice. Then we go on to number two, which is our hands. Nice smile there, Melvin. Thank you. Not looking too serious, which is good. And we can do that quite, quite strongly. Get our, get our fingers nice and relaxed. And this is a good one for your shoulders. You step forward, put your weight on, on your right foot, and then just let your arm drop. Let all the tension drop out of your arm. And then do the same thing uh, with, your, with your left hand. Now you're nice and relaxed and, and ready to go. Um, I still do these exercises just before I wander on for a, a concert. Quite nice to get yourself going. So preparatory gesture. Um, we tend to use the term upbeat in English, but that's not a great, uh, not a great translation really. Um, if the music starts on the third beat of the bar, then the, the preparatory beat goes across, doesn't it? Not, not up. So um, preparatory beat is, is what we've gone for. Um, of course, we're showing when to play, but also, also how to play. So from your experience as a player or a singer, how is it that you know when you should make a sound? It's an interesting question because most of us start to do that at such an early stage in our development that it's quite a difficult question to answer. You just, you just play when you see a beat, don't you? But, but what do we, what, how do we do that? What do we, what do we mean? In some ways it's obvious, but let's, let's work it out. Um, an impulse is given from which our brains compute when and at what speed we should play. So it's, it's, 
basic elementary physics actually. Um, distance travelled, time taken, and from that our brains compute uh, velocity. So the crucial things here are that the, the gesture needs to contain an active impulse, something that, that, that ignites, not too, not too passive. Uh, the, the impulse takes place usually a beat before the sound. The gesture should start and finish in the same place. That's an interesting one. If, if I demonstrate here, uh, if I, I can give an impulse, but if I do that, it's not particularly helpful. Um, you maybe see that next time you're playing an ensemble or an orchestra. That's quite a, quite a common one. So the gesture should start and finish in the same place. And the gesture should accelerate towards the point at which you intend the sound, sound to come. Yeah, there should be a, a sense of acceleration towards the, the beat. Uh, my golf coach tells me that the, the human brain doesn't deal with deceleration very well. We're much better at processing acceleration, which is why my, my putting is so dreadful apparently. So a good way of thinking of that is bouncing a tennis ball on the ground. So here's, here's Melvin uh, doing that. So if you just imagine you've got a tennis ball in each hand and just bounce the ball on the ground. So that's, that's a really good way of getting that sense of accelerating towards a point. Even if you're dropping the ball quite gently, there's still a sense of going, going towards it. So we come to the baton. Uh, conductors sometimes use batons. Uh, the reasons for this are, are buried in the, the mists of time, of course, but it's, it's kind of a thing. Um, I have no strong feelings. I, I, don't, I don't think I would um, use whether you're using a baton or not in my judgment of you as a conductor. Um, but it's, it's use, useful to have the ability to use it, I suppose, because if you get comfortable with it, you can then, you can then choose, to, choose to use it or not. Um, as I say there, you, you can get everything from, from Boulez, who never used the baton, to Sir Adrian, who has a, a huge, big, big, long one. But uh, length isn't everything, as we, as we all know. Uh, think of the baton as an extension of your lower arm. So there will be some images uh, here, still images, um, when we actually uh, finish, finish the, the project. But by that, I mean that you, you, you have a, there's a sense of, uh, from the inside of your elbow, through your arm, through your hand, in, into the stick. So you want to avoid this sort of thing. You also want to avoid this sort of angle, where there's sharp angles between the stick and the hands. Just a nice continuous line from elbow through to the, the tip of the baton. So here's Melvin showing us how to transfer this idea of bouncing the tennis ball into the baton. So if you have a pencil or a pen or whatever, um, you can go along with this one. Uh, we just click there. So I, I would never do anything as, as dull as, as angling, as fishing, but um, I suppose it's a little bit like casting the rod and winding in the, the reel um, as an analogy. So posture and, and presence and, and upbeats and so on. Um, here's a video of a conductor giving a variety of upbeats. Um, so they have no music here, they, they just have a, a, they just played the notes of a chord uh, and the conductor gave a variety of impulses, some good, some bad, um, and they had to try and interpret whether they should play long, short, loud, heavy, light, uh, whatever, without any, um, any information in the, in the notation. Um, so here we are, it's me, I'm afraid. So that's of course something that you can practice with even with two two other people so you can get in a group of three and just play play for each other basic beat patterns so two three and four these are, are universally understood so it's important to to get them right um and the the innovation of technology here is is the use of gifs so uh this is a gif of melvin doing a, a nice legato two four and he'll, he'll go on forever uh, he, can, he could last for the whole quarantine, so you can you can sort of view that on your screen and uh, and copy along is the is the idea. And there's a, a version in staccato, and a little bit of text about 
the, the difference. So, so note that in the legato version, most of the motion is from the elbow, um, which gives a little bit of a lateral feel. The wrist has some flexibility, but not too much. Shoulder and upper arm are still. Um, the staccato version is much more, much more in the wrist, which gives a little click uh, and a short crispness, so we're not using too much arm there. And we'll have the same things for 3-4. So down, out and up. So if you're right-handed, you go out. If you're left-handed, you go out to your left. And the same thing in, in staccato. So those, those would all be there just to practice along to for as long as you, as long as you felt the need. Same thing in 4-4. Four, four. So we come into the centre of our body before we go out. So right-handed conductor down, left, right, up. Left-handed down, into the centre, to the right, before going out to the left. And so on. So a little bit more just about the different hinges that we have. So we have the, we have the wrist, we have the elbow, and we have the shoulder. You can think of this a little bit like gears on a car or a bicycle. So, so conducting from the wrist is like first gear, the elbow is third gear, and the shoulder is, is, is fifth gear. If you're using the wrist only, the gesture will be quite small, quite focused, energetic, therefore very good for crisp, light uh, staccato music. The elbow and shoulder should be static. Using the elbow increases the size of the gesture, enables a bit more horizontal movement, very useful for legato, or to show strong on pulses with flowing motion. Wrist will be flexible, but not too much or else it becomes a bit octopus-like. And then using the shoulder increases the potential size of the gesture again. As the size of the gesture increases, so must the speed at which your arm moves, which is incredibly obvious, but, but worth, worth remembering. Um, so a little, little exercise here that maybe we can do together. If we have a metronome on at 120 beats per minute, uh, maybe we just start beating very small and then gradually get bigger and try and keep up with yourself. So we see, of course, that at that tempo, if you're going to conduct with your whole arm, it becomes actually quite difficult to do that accurately. Um, it requires actually quite a lot of brain cells to do that. And if your brain is concentrating so much on keeping up with yourself, you're not able to listen to what's happening. So, so small is good but only if you're using the correct hinge. A small beat with the whole of your arm, to go back to the idea of gears on a car, is a little bit like trying to, to pull away in fifth gear at three miles an hour. You know, it's just not going to be, going to be particularly effective. So a little, little clip here with Catherine. Good way of, of just being aware of that. If you take your other hand, put it on your wrist, and then you move to your elbow, and then you go up to your shoulder, and then she'll do the same thing again with, with, a, with a baton. You can just get a, a sense of practicing what those different uh, hinges are. Stopping, releasing the sound. Uh, we should apply the same principles as starting it. We need to give information as to how, not just, not just when. So we can, we can release the sound. A good way to do that is with a sort of anti-clockwise motion. Can be done with one hand, can be done with the other, can be done with both. Can be done very energetically and, and specifically. It can be done slowly and gently with a tapered release. Lots of different ways to do that. So we just suggest, um, as you work through the videos, paying attention to the ends as well as the beginnings. So then we come on to the, 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 the work be, workbook exercises. So trying right from the very beginning to apply what can be a little bit dry in terms of learning beat patterns to actually conducting music um, and hopefully having the chance to work on that with, with instrumentalists. So then talking a little bit about the workbook, as I've already mentioned, there'll be three video views with each extract, a video of the, the conductor plus the score, a video only of the conductor, and then a slightly different angle, which also shows the, the players. And you can, as I said already, you can download PDFs of the scores, piano reductions and parts. So the first one, uh, workbook exercise one, beginning of Roman Juliet Overture by Tchaikovsky. Um, this text would appear alongside the video so you would be able to see the score at the same time. But just explaining the it's legato style, um, no click, just legato, smooth movements, relaxed wrist, etc, etc, etc. So here's the first version. 
So feel free to conduct along to this if you want to. So you see, you don't even have to read music. You've got a nice little blue bar going across the across the screen for you. Um, so the second the second view is just the the same angle of the conductor uh, without the score, and this is the the third angle where we see the, the the response from the musicians as well. Smart being a bit of a soloist there and carrying on longer than the rest of the, the ensemble, um, but you, I think, it's important to see the, the 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 reaction of the players and the physicality of that as well. So same thing going on to number two, the little Mendelssohn excerpt that I showed you earlier. Three four also legato, slightly quicker tempo, but still quite quite relaxed. Um, talking about the beats all being on the same horizontal level. Don't worry too much at this stage what your other hand is doing, but you will notice how the left hand is used to show the top of the crescendo and, and what sort of articulation uh, is wanted from the players. So this is Melvin again, I think. Yep, here we go. way of seeing how much video lag everybody has because everyone's conducting at slightly <laughs> slightly different times um, funny to funny to watch then again the same ideas but this is the number three so Tchaikovsky Nutcracker now we're in 2-4 tempo is quicker and the character is now staccato rather than legato so smaller gestures mostly from the wrist rather than the the, the elbow and a little bit of uh, advice about the the accents that appear in the in the score is to especially in the kind of more beginning exercises not not being in any way disrespectful to those three who are on those videos because they're all they're all great but to use to use students sometimes as well um, so that there, there isn't a feeling that when when you're starting from the beginning uh, that you're looking at somebody who's meant to be a be an expert so there's a, a range of students and I, I do some myself um, later on into it as well but lots of different uh, types of ensembles so we have strings winds and uh, and brass as you saw there um, and as I say, going through all those those different ideas. So that's kind of it from what I wanted to talk about. Um, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, that's my email address. If you want to ping any questions by email, I'll try and sort of monitor that um, as we as we carry on from here. Do do feel free to get in touch. A couple of social media uh, links there for the project. Um, 
I did a um, when the lockdown started. I, I, I got a I think I think it's ten or eleven little clips, little video clips from colleagues, friends, uh, conductors, teachers of conducting, some young conductors as well, uh, with little short videos giving advice on on how to use lockdown time when when nobody was available to conduct. So you, you can access all those there. There's there's some quite interesting ones, including Mark Elder and Marin Elsop and and some fairly eminent figures like that. So that's um, that's me done. Hope that was uh, of, of some interest and very, very happy to, to take any, any questions. Thank you, Mark. That was really <clears throat> a fantastic um, presentation and also great that you got us um, standing up and, and participating. It's the first to, to have a, at a research forum, having us all, all conducting. So thank you very much for that. There, I'm sure we have lots of questions which we'll take. In, if you can put um, click on in the participants saying put your hand up. Um, I'll also keep an eye on the chat and I'm sure I'm sure um, that Mark will be doing the same. And if anything comes in from people who are watching on YouTube, we'll try and incorporate those. But I'm sure that th this project is so relevant to our current situation. And I'm sure uh, um, we have plenty of questions. So who wants to start? I've got, Mich I can see Michelle's hand up. Do you want to go, Michelle? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Mark. Absolutely brilliant. It was so interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm no conductor, but I always wish that I'd had a chance to learn a little bit. So. So now I'm sorted. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's a, it's an amazing project, you know, and it's you know you obviously got the funding because you're you're a great team to be leading this. I just wondered what what do you think the world needs? Does it need more conductors? Does it need better conductors? Does it need greater diversity in conductors? What what is your kind of ideal for the conducting world through this project? Well, I think. Well, there, there, are, there are a number of ways to answer that. I mean, I, I think in a, in a, if, if you're talking about the, the world of conducting in terms of who we see in front of our orchestras on, on TV and listen to on the radio, then then yes, we do need greater diversity. Of, of course we do. Um, I don't need to tell any of you that uh, until relatively recently, uh, life was very hard if you were female and you wanted to conduct. Um, the change in that in the last five years is unbelievable, I think. I mean, really incredible. Um, and it will take a while to to get to some sort of equality, but of course that's that's inevitable in a in a in a profession that people tend to do until they die. You know, there's there's a lot of a lot of conductors in their fifties who've still got another thirty years of the career left. So it'll it'll take time, but you know, I, I fully believe in ten years' time, if you look at conductors under the age of forty, there will be much more uh, diversity in terms of gender and and race. Um, in terms of what we're trying to do with the project, I mean, you you, you kind of in a way answered your own question when you say yeah, I always wanted to be a conductor and now I'm sorted. Um, I, I really believe that if you take if you take somebody who has musical skill, you know, and of course what we're not trying to do is train musicians from, from the beginning. Um, you learn to be, you know, when you learn to play an instrument from the age of 10, you learn to play the instrument and you also learn to be a musician, don't you? And that's, we often forget that, that that, that goes hand in hand. Um, by the time you get to the point at which you start conducting, hopefully you're a good musician. <laughs> you, you, you certainly ought to have enough musical authority to stand in front of whoever, whoever it is you're standing in front of um, and, and gain their respect. Um, so assuming, taking as a given that, that there's a musical skill there um, and assuming that we're talking not necessarily about preparing somebody to stand up in the Met or Covent Garden, I, I really believe that you can equip people with the technical skills to be really very capable and competent conductors really quite quickly. So, so that's the that's basically the plan really to just try and help help people to be better. And, and in doing so, you know, what was Kodai's statement was that the, the most important person in the country is not the, the chief conductor of the opera in the capital city. It's the it's the people teaching music in the small towns, um, and that's really true of conducting as well, isn't it? You know, so if if we can improve um, and and enable uh, the, the the people who are just taking small ensemble classes and you know whole class primary school wider opportunities teaching and so on, you know, if we can help those people just to be better, then then that's um, I think a, a great service to to uh, to the whole the whole uh, the whole art form. I think. Does that answer? Thank your question? you. I think Jane is next. Jane, do you want to ask a question? 
Mark, I just want to echo what Michelle said about the presentation and the project, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, Michelle, that was a terrific question and Mark, a really great answer. Mine, uh, mine is, uh, is a little bit different. I wanted to ask you about the difference between, do you perceive differences between conducting um, instrumental ensembles and choirs? And I ask because I used to do, as a, as a solo singer, I used to work very regularly with a, with a chamber orchestra in London, and they use different conductors. And I said to them once, have you ever thought about working with so-and-so? And they said, oh, certainly not. They're a choral conductor. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong with that? And the person I was talking to said, oh, we couldn't possibly work with a choral conductor. They call us folks. And I just wonder if you had any 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 comment on that. Um, I think well, sorry, there's a kind of worms there. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think you know there, there are there are there are examples of that, not just using choral conducting. You know, there there are certain things, and and I think this is where this idea of you know when you're conducting at a professional level, um, you're you're not really a pedagogue you're not really giving basic training um you're just giving giving direction so so if you ask uh i, I remember uh, working a little bit with sir colin davis um i, I was on the, the lso's kind of mentoring scheme for young conductors um 15 years or more now ago um and somebody asked him exactly that and he said well you know, we watched him taking a rehearsal with the lso chorus of Brahms Requiem, maybe I can't remember. Um, so the, the chorus master trains the choir, so Sir Colin turns up, tells a few jokes and inspires them for one rehearsal. And then the next day they get together with the orchestra and do the concert. Um, question to him, did, did, did he do anything different because it was a choir rather than an orchestra? Absolutely not, yeah, absolutely not. On the other hand, there is something in the, in the training of a choir which is very, very different from the training of a brass band or a wind band or a string ensemble or a jazz group. So, so I think, I think, there, I think there, there are some differences. Um, there are probably some prejudices, particularly in this country, about choral conductors. Um, some of those will, most of those are probably un, unfounded. Um, and it's something that we are trying to do. I mean, I, we don't, we being the RNCM conducting department, um, so Clark and I, I suppose, we, we, we don't believe in compartmentalizing conducting. You know, if you go to the States, uh, you study orchestral conducting, or you study choral conducting, or you study wind band conducting, or you study jazz, uh, and then you get a job doing that. You're the director of orchestras, or you're the director of choirs, or whatever. Um, that sort of works there because there are enough jobs for it. Um, it would never work in this country because there aren't enough jobs um, and I think fundamentally it's the wrong thing so we we absolutely consciously don't do that um, we don't have a choral conducting course we don't have a wind conducting course however what we do um, is try and uh, identify some talent amongst the choral world of people who are maybe already quite advanced as choral conductors um, and that what we can help them to do is to on the one side develop that but on the other side to also become a little bit more comfortable standing in front of an orchestra because that often is where it goes wrong and that's not because the choral conductors don't have the the talent or to do that it's that they've never been taught the skills to do that um i mean i i, I sort of you know somewhat flippantly sometimes sometimes joke about when the the the, the 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 chorus master has trained trained the choir the amateur choral society they hire a scratch orchestra to come along on the day of the rehearsal um the conductor thinks oh oh i better i better get a baton because there's an orchestra here and they, they kind of unleash the the longest baton you've ever seen and all the strings shuffle backwards because they think they're going to lose their eyes and you know that's just a just a question of training um so we, what we're trying to do is is help those people to be better because there is a real opportunity um, in that situation where if the orchestra turns up on the day and the conductor actually knows what they're doing then it's like oh wow that's that's amazing um, so um, uh, Ellie Slorach uh, who graduated a couple of years ago Joe Judge who's currently a student th those are those are those those kind of people so so I think I think there is something in it and there is and, and that's and that's it's partly just because you can be a choral conductor only you know it's possible to do that you can be busy you know, you can easily end up with four or five choirs and and, and never actually conduct instruments. Um, but you just you just need to learn to do it. Is that uh, is that any help? <laughs> Without being too rude about choral conducting. <laughs> I mean, what I would say is that I 
I would regard myself as competent. I mean, I'm a, I'm a brass player originally. That's my specialism. I'm absolutely fine working with young wind and brass players, telling them to play their instruments better. I'm not too bad at that from a string playing perspective because I've studied it quite hard. And I have a, a, one of my deepest, darkest secrets is that I did play the violin from the age of eight to about 12. So I have some uh, understanding of, of what that feels like. I, I would never, ever hold myself out as being competent to train a choir. Um, perfectly happy, happy to to conduct the choir along with the orchestra um, but I, I defer to people with with greater knowledge of that because there there is there are specialisms for sure thank you very much indeed that's really terrific thank you can we have david horn you're next yeah hi mark thanks very much for that um you reminded me actually how late the the masters conducting program has started at the rncm and and one thing that i know you i and other people have have discussed before is the relative, well, almost a paucity of any programs for um, undergraduate students. Um, and that's really interesting to me. So even the Curtis Institute that has had our conducting program, I think since it was in, uh, conceived in the 1920s, it was always a postgraduate program at a time when no other program there was a postgraduate program. And I'm just wondering if that could be a problem, that it's somehow considered something that people go to after undergraduate study. I mean, I can understand all the logistical reasons for it. And if you can't have a, an orchestra or a choir to conduct, you know, that, that's really going to hamper things. But it does seem to me that it's really odd that we kind of consider this as something that people go, go to a higher level once they've done other things. Yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a really, good, really good point, David. Um, I think, you know, there, there are some countries of the world where you can do an undergraduate conducting degree. You know, you, you can do that in Spain and Portugal, for example. Um, you can't really do it in this country or in the States. Uh, in Germany, they, they still think in the kind of five year thing, you know, so that if you if you start conducting, you do it for five years, regardless of whether you're 18 or 23 or 24 or whatever. Um, I talked about Jorma Panula, the Finnish, Finnish teacher. Um, he, he certainly felt, and I, and I kind of subscribe to this, that if you're talking about preparing people for a, a career in the professional world, conducting professional orchestras, it's it's better to have some experience of that. If you've played in professional orchestras and sat on the other side of the fence and experienced not just good conducting and bad conducting, but good and bad management, you know, what, I mean, I, I still remember the things that as a, as a freelance tuba player sitting in the Halley in the mid nineties, I still remember things that conductors did or didn't do that really pissed me off. Um, and I, and I try always re to remember um, not, not to do those things. Um, and it certainly exposes you to the repertoire if you, if you played it. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for not starting too young. On the other hand, the industry likes, the next young thing you know at the moment young conductors are very much in vogue um so in some you, you could argue that training conductors at, at undergraduate level is necessary just in order to protect them a little bit um but the whole other side of that is i suppose the kind of area that this project has worked out if you're talking about people who are going to conduct in the community sector or in education then uh, absolutely why why not train people um, more in undergraduate degrees and that's, that's certainly something we're we're hoping to do through the the revalidation degree to, to give you know we, we do a bit at the moment we do you know, all uniquely uh, amongst British conservatories certainly all of our first year undergrads on the classical course they do four one-hour workshops and conducting um, in large groups in their first term um, so everybody does a little bit um, and then there's a module in fourth year we're kind of looking at how we can kind of plug plug that through but I, I think it's certainly and, that, and actually most of the places I mean in Stavanger for example just to talk about my, my partners you can do an undergraduate degree in conducting there but you must also study an instrument and, and you must be good enough on your instrument to get into the college so um, I think running the two things side by side is is, is important it's a great idea really sorry just a, a quick comment on that I've seen a lot of conduct um, composers for example when I've run workshops with them and they conduct back to front and stuff like that they don't know how to conduct a 5-4 and it, it just seems really good if there was some kind of basic understanding that you'd have that as musicianship training yeah absolutely and that's you know hopefully you know if you want to learn to i can't remember maybe alex will tell me i can't remember which number in the technique workbook on conduct it five four and six four is but it's it's not it's not too far in so uh you get to the the, the first promenade from pictures and exhibition um which is probably one of the pieces i always get lost in when i conduct I, if, if i'm going to get lost it's always in a five four bar um so it's, it's good to good to tackle that early on but composers i mean i didn't mention composers you're absolutely right you know uh, in the world of composer workshops 
if, if as a composer you can actually conduct your own music and other people's as well, uh, that's that's a good skill actually. It's quite quite marketable. We're getting a number of comments in the chat um, um, column about different types of expertise in, um, in, in conducting. And um, Adam, I think, Adam Swain, I think we might like to see you conduct a band sometime. It sounds as though you've studied it um, and about the, the sort of technique. So if anybody wants to have a look at those comments, that's that's really quite um, interesting. So Jeff Thomason, you're next. Hi, Mark. Thanks for that. It's really interesting. I must say that conducting is one area of music I've always shied away from. And just to echo what David said, it's the one thing I really would have welcomed as an undergraduate music student at university. You had training in everything, but no conducting training. So I think this course is designed for people like me. I want to get to know it better. How important do you think it is for people to come to conducting through having had experience as an orchestral player first. And so they've seen things from the other side of the podium. Yeah, I think, as, as I said a little bit, little bit earlier, I think, I think that is important. And I think it's, you know, one, one, um, one can talk, I'm, I'm not going to name any eminent um, English universities, but um, there, there is a kind of thing of the mm, organ scholar, um, which is a sort of, uh, a certain breed, I suppose, in a way. Um, so yeah, you kind of people who are really, really intelligent. They're really, really good musicians. They're highly trained. They probably work quite a lot with choirs. Um, they can do all kinds of things. Um, but if, if if you've never actually spent much time within uh, within an orchestra, it's, it's not it's not just the repertoire and and the kind of technique of that. It's also just the just the life in a way. Um, I remember actually we had a, a junior fellow. Um, probably going back about 10 years ago, Carlos del Coeto, some of you might, might remember him, um, kind of half Mexican, half Spanish, but he'd studied at Cambridge. Um, did, he did undergrad and then masters at Cambridge. So he was there for maybe even a PhD. He was there for seven years or something. And he was really, really kind of in the Cambridge conducting scene, conducted all the student orchestras, uh, was very, very popular. Um, and I remember when he came to the RNCM and then you know we talked probably, it was, it was more than a term. It, it was like February, it was halfway through his first year. And he said, you know, I, I've, I've I finally realised that actually um, normal life is not like Cambridge. And, um, and at Cambridge, everybody likes to be lectured to. <laughs> they like to give lectures and they like to be on the receiving end of lectures. But professional musicians aren't like that, are they? It's not like that in a conservatoire. Um, so just, just that sort of um, understanding of what orchestral life is and, and what annoys people is, 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 is really helpful, I think. So I, I think so. And I think even with... You know, we, we've had some some phenomenally successful um, young students, people like Duncan Ward and Jamie Phillips, who, who really were already having their career when they finished their undergraduate degree, um, having taught them at the, at the university on the on the joint course. Even the two of those, you know, Jamie was in the NYO, Duncan was a, P, he was a composer, but he, but he played piano in the NYO. Um, they grew up around professional musicians, so th even though they never got experience of playing in a professional orchestra they were still around that a little bit and i think that's really really crucial i think um, thanks it, it's been actually a privilege to play for some of our student conductors who've gone on to do great things yeah and it's great for you know great going going to uh, your orchestra in wilmslow jeff and stockport and the local amateur orchestras you know that's a that's a really, a really great environment for for student conductors because um you know, in, in, in the RNCM, we have to kind of, we have to be there to monitor them. You know, we can't leave student conductors alone with an orchestra. Otherwise, the head of strings is knocking on my door going, why was a first year master student conducting the orchestra for three hours without anybody there to supervise them? You know, everything is supervised and controlled. So it's, it's a really important part of our, our training for them that they go out to the amateur orchestras and meet all these um, often very successful and opinionated people in their in their different different worlds who are more than more than willing to give them a bit of feedback which is which is great because they'll suddenly get that when they start working in the professional world that's for sure thanks larry you're next hi mark um really enjoyed the presentation i was thinking that the last um conducting class collaboration with Ensemble Plus was actually the live audience was sports coaches and sports executives. And I was wondering if your project is targeting things outside of music in the way the RNCM obviously has elsewhere, if you kind of buy into the conductor as a, a coach and leadership more nebulously, 
And if your project has gone to other areas to get training for conductors and leadership and um, and in, in those crossover areas. Thanks, Larry. Um, in, in relation to this specific project, no. Um, we, we, you know, uh, as with all these things, you, you start off with world plans for world domination and then you, then you realise you have to deliver the bloody thing. Um, so we're, we're not kind of going outside of, of that with this, uh, but it is something that we're, that we're doing in other ways. You, you mentioned that, uh, that session, which is a, a session we've done now for la the last two years. Um, Manchester Metropolitan University runs a, a master's in sport directorship. So this is a course which is Dan, Dan Siders there, he knows all about this. Um, this is a, a course for elite people in the professional sporting world. So it's a distance learning master's course aimed at football managers, uh, coaches, chief execs, finance people in the sporting industry. So you typically get you know, Mark Chapman from the Match of the Day presenter, uh, the, the Arsenal ladies football coach, the development director of Welsh rugby, you know, pe people like that come, come on that course. And they wanted to come in and do a, do a conducting uh, workshop. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating. I, I really do believe in there's a lot of a lot to learn between music and, and elite sports coaching. Um, they they came and just sat in the middle of a class um, and experienced the, the sort of real time decision making that was going on um, and also experienced the the immediate on the spot direct feedback, often very honest feedback that we give as teachers to our conducting students in a public forum in front of an orchestra of, of 50 people. Um, so that, that kind of thing is, is something that we're absolutely developing. Um, I mean, it can be a little bit gimmicky, I think, the sort of conductor does leadership work, workshop for corporate people kind of thing. But if it's, if it's done in the, way, in the right way, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. And it's, it's certainly something that um, we look to, to develop further. Thanks, Mark. I can't see any ha other hands up, so I'm going to ask um, a, a question myself. I'm, I'm interested in your response about how um, elite sports people can learn from, from conductors. D could it work the other way as well? Can you see a, a sort of a, a collaboration, a project even, that might involve um, sports scientists working with conductors and perhaps other musicians? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's you know, it's, I mean, just in the use of technology, of course. I mean, I, I talked about how we how we use video quite a lot in, in conducting. I mean, I, I um, I've done that for 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 as long as I've I've been teaching. Um, something I learned from uh, I, I mentioned that I play golf. Um, I know most golfers are idiots, but I'm Scottish, so I get away with it. We all, we all play golf. Um, but I, I, when I having a few golf lessons and the, the technology that, that, that my teacher was using, um, using apps, there's an app called Dartfish, which is basically just a kind of video app on your phone, but you immediately slow down to quarter speed, half speed. You do all those kind of you know drawing yellow lines on the screen and circling things that you see them do on the telly and so on. And all that kind of stuff is is potentially quite useful. Um, so I, I've I've certainly learned a little bit from that. And of course we're 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 way behind in music in terms of the use of uh, the use of technology. So I I think there are there are crossovers there for for sure. Um, and and it's something that we can we, we, we can look into more. Um, I think that one of the things the interesting things that came out of the sports coaches from from Manchester Met uh, was just the sort of hierarchy of who's in charge. You know they they the, the sort of idea that. Well, you're the conductor, but actually, even if you're the music director of an orchestra, um, you're a guest. You're you're only there, you know, sixteen weeks of the year at the most. Um, the person who's really in charge of the orchestra is the concertmaster. Um, so you're kind of in charge, but you're not really in charge, and that sort of blew their mind in terms of the whole hierarchy of um, highly paid. You know, there, there was one guy who was, I think, he was the head of sports science for Manchester City. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm technically in charge of all these multi-million pound footballers. But of course, if I told them directly what I thought, they would just walk out in a huff and never come back sort of thing. So the ways in which we sort of deal with all those all those relationships are are, are very, very much to be learned on both sides, I think. Although orchestral players tend not to do as well as footballers, sadly. But um, that's a, a good point. I was wondering... Um, about whether the once the project has finished this project whether you have plans to do maybe perhaps an evaluative study um you even with, with perhaps a master's or a, a doctoral student would find this quite an interesting study to look at the the impact or to to, to assess it to evaluate the, the the project and and where it might go next yeah i think so i mean you know that we're, we're very conscious of the fact that we'll we'll launch this thing and, and we'll have various conferences and dissemination events and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
we, we also we then need to to monitor its use and see where it's going and um, develop it as we go. Um, so that's absolutely something that's that's in the in the back of the minds for sure. Um, the, the the area that we're not also really not looking into at all is opera, um, which is a whole whole kind of other thing. So um, there are various sort of specialism spin-offs that um, that are certainly certainly possible. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from anyone? I'm not, I can't see any more hands up on um, blue hands up. Nope. So, um, is there anybody got anything else to ask? Um, I was wondering whether we should hear from Melvin, but uh, given that he's he's here, we saw him on, on screen, but um, I don't know if you want to talk about being part of the project. Hi, oh, so, sorry, yeah, being part of the project has been really quite interesting actually, because it's brought me back to especially in those workbook stuff, it's brought me back to the, the very basic and the very beginning. And it actually made me rethink about how, how, I, how I've learned the basics and whether there's stuff that maybe I should revisit and change. And it's quite interesting to, to see how much, how much you don't think about when, because you think about it so much when you first start out. And then now I almost never think about, oh, a four four is this pattern, a two four is this pattern. And, and it's been quite nice to go back and, and visit it. Yeah. And I think it's quite quite useful for so many of my friends around me because they 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 have they have they can tell when when the conductor is bad, but they can't really tell why the conductor is bad a lot of the times. And I think this will help really demystify quite a lot of it. I think, yeah. I, I think that point, Melvin, about about basic technique is is really useful because if you compare that to instrumentalists, you know, as, as a horn player, you know, the first thing you do when you, in the morning is you, you do a bit of buzzing on your mouthpiece, then you put it in your instrument, you play a few lip slurs. Um, if you're a pianist, you warm up with a few scales, you know, in, in most instrumental um, disciplines, we, we do actually constantly use that very basic um, beginners, you know, entry level basic technique stuff, um, but in, in conducting, maybe not so much. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to, to go back to. It's another interesting aspect of conducting is that, especially if you compare it to the sporting world, uh, I often use the analogy of a, a tennis player or a golfer, um, you know, the, the, the higher your ranking goes as a tennis player, the more coaches and support you have around you. You, you have a nutrition coach and a fitness coach and a mind coach and a, a, a service coach or whatever, you know, you get more and more support. Whereas as conductors, um, once we start to get somewhere, we're meant to be kind of all powerful and not need any help. So the, the idea that we don't have any coaching or, or access to people to support us is is a little bit bizarre in a sense. So that's certainly something that, that I find myself doing a little bit more, um, often quite secretly, you know, conductors who are maybe having very fine careers and they just they just want a little bit of little bit of an MOT, a little bit of a service. Um, and they, they come along with some videos and chat about a few things. Um, but it's, it's almost kind of, almost a feeling that we shouldn't admit that that's necessary, but uh, why, why not? A very important um, point, and it's something that's relevant to, to all of us in our, our professional professional lives. Um, the, the, I can't see any more hands, but um, I do want to, to flag up the, the importance of, of this work and creating online resources in, in our current climate, and um, particularly with the, the pandemic. And just to flag up two other events before we thank, thank Mark Heron finally. Um, the first of these is um, Prism Future Music, which is happening on Monday, 15th of June. Um, it's an online festival with world premieres of Prism commissioned music. So it's something that's really central to RNCM, um, RNCM's work. Um, it's, it's going to look at writing, um, Commission Music and Writing on Artificial Intelligence and Creativity. On Tuesday, the 16th of June, there will be elements of it be broadcast in the RNCM radio show, which Larry hosts now rather famously. Um, and so that, that's um, something that you should really look at. There's a hashtag Prism Future Music, which you should look at. And there's a web page on the Prism web page that gives you a full um, outline of, of the event on Monday. Now, the second one, thinking about lockdown, lockdown research, we started off our research forum series with David Horn talking about his creative work 
um, under lockdown. And that really sparked a lot of interest, both at the RNCM and elsewhere. And we've had, um, we've uh, organized a, a whole a whole session of um, the research forum. And it features um, Dr. Sam Duffy's research, um, which is about music um, resources online. It comes from her PhD project and obviously has particular resonance now. And we've got smaller, shorter contributions contributions from uh, Dr. Larry Goves, Mark Dyer, Isabel Benito Guterres, excuse the pronunciation, Anna Appleby and Alex Webb, who's here um, with us today. So um, that is Wednesday, the 17th of June. It will be a really good way of following up from the, the sort of um, the way in which we've engaged with the, the whole um, adapting to our, our lockdown conditions, not least in, in having these research forum seminars at all. So um, please be there, please join us. And I'd like to thank Mark Heron for a fascinating um, talk and, and really giving us an insight into um, the potential for, for sharing, I suppose, expertise in the way that you are through this um, European funded project. So thank you very much and see you all soon. Sadly, not in person, but have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Cheers. Take care. Bye.